welcome you all firstly miss anju dubey pandey team lead gender responsive governance un women india miss shikha mukherji journalist author and gender expert dr harbin arora wiki uh, president wiki uh, miss anju kapoor national president wiki anti sexual harassment council or as we call it the ash council and lastly and certainly not the least all the wonderful participants who joined us this thursday fine evening uh, i am nikita garg i am a practicing advocate and i'm proud to be associated with wiki ash from the very inception and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all on this session on exploring sexual harassment as a facet of gender based violence we're also here in response to a global call for raising awareness in support of 16 days of activism against gender based violence it is an annual international campaign that kicks off on the 25th of november every year the international day for elimination of violence against women the this runs till 10th of december that is today uh, the national the international right human rights day may i first introduce our first guest for the evening miss anju dubey pandey She is a specialist and team lead in gender responsive governance with UN Women India. She brings over 21 years of experience on promoting gender equality and working for women's empowerment, with a particular focus on ending um, gender-based violence for little girls and women. Uh, as a feminist, humanist, and a gender trainer, she believes that evidenced research and data-driven policies. complemented with capacity building for multiple stakeholders would drive home the behavioral change we so require she has published several books and articles and training manuals including her first gender training manual for law enforcement agencies in india she loves to travel she loves to garden and of course her furry friend milo who i can't wait to meet and it's an honor and a privilege to have you with us today ma'am thank you thank you for being here May I now introduce a second guest for the evening Ms Shikha Mukherjee uh, a journalist and an author and she frequents several op-ed columns uh, such as the wire deccan chronicle the times of india and i have had the privilege of reading ma'am through these newspapers and many more to her name she is also a commentator on politics and policy in west bengal and has also worked as a political editor in the times of india based out of kolkata She is currently working as an advisor for Co as Co Corporate Social Responsibility Division with APJ Surendra Group, and has contributed to real change in these organizations, as is evidenced by the work that she has done relentlessly in these organizations towards women and children alike. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you on the panel today, ma'am. Thank uh, you. It's an absolute honor. May I also introduce Dr. Harbin Arora. president and founder of wiki dr rurora is also the founder and global chairperson of all ladies league all the women's economic forum wef and she is a global icon and also a business woman a philanthropist a humanitarian and much more who it's always a pleasure to have you with us ma'am yeah thank you sisters Uh, Shikha, ma'am, may I please request you to mute just, your. Just give me half a second, half a second, huh? Um, I need to take this off. Hello, yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm yes. so okay. okay. <laughs> We're new to the digital world. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have. Space. Absolutely. Let that. me introduce uh, Miss Anju Kapoor, National President of Wiki Ash Council. She is the founding partner of AKMD Legal and a sociologist. She has done her masters in corporate law and frequents as adjunct professor in top law colleges while also conducting several workshops and seminars on various legal issues for institutions schools and colleges and companies uh it's a pleasure to have you all with us today and may i now request our national president anju kapoor to make her opening speech and welcome address thank you thanks nikita but before i start uh, dr harbin arora the wiki founder president can i ask you to just share with us ma'am a, a vision of wiki that you have and what this day means to you and for all the women that we are here together at wiki today uh, thank you my sister anju you most most inspiring and thank you for bringing us in touch with such amazing incredible 
uh, remarkable women as Anju and Shikha uh, to enlighten our way forward. But uh, the answer to your question is the question that you asked just now is what do we do to get ourselves heard and what do we do to make a shift, create a consciousness shift and uh, Wiki is the answer to that. That's exactly what we are trying to do when we have 154 councils and I see them growing to 250 by the end of next year because women are now suddenly coming up and saying, can we organize ourselves around this theme and that theme? And this is the result of a movement we've been working on. And Nikita mentioned All Ladies League, Women Economic Forum, now She Economy that we are doing. For the past 10 years, we've sort of been building what Shikha very nicely said as the culture to speak and the culture to be and to own up ourselves as women and to have the self-confidence. And it's been 10 years of healing ourselves as women, I think. And together with this beautiful ethos of sisterhood, this she for she spirit, which is so uh, dear to us, as you know, Anju, uh, the Shakti Bandhan that we celebrate every year, uh, this spirit has emboldened each one to step up and speak up and stand in our truth. And that is creating ripples of change around us. And I think we just have to continue this process of organizing ourselves, uh, becoming more solidaire, have more solidarity, a solid solidarity, and also have more organization. The way we have at the Women's Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, like let's say the Ash Council, having at the national level, the state level, UT level, uh, and city grassroots movement. So we have already about 500 uh, state councils and other councils around that uh, and national councils and another 100 bilateral business councils with about uh, 95 countries already because we are very global. A quarter million members all over the world is no mean feat. Yes, we've developed it over the past 10 years, but uh, most of it is global. Uh, we have about 60,000 in India, and that is a very, very small number, I, I, I concede and reckon, uh, in a country as vast as ours. We really need to do a lot more to reach out and uh, empower other women with the confidence to speak up, which is where I count on the work of the Ash Council at the national level at out for, for doing endeavors towards outreach towards the community and also ringing the bells at the doors of the ministries and the government and whatever institutions uh, that we need to knock on to get ourselves heard. Uh, the rest, the experts over here will guide us and that is pretty much from the context of the Ash Council, what we are doing at Wiki. As I said, 154 sectors, this is an important sector. If we don't get this piece right, we don't get any other piece right. So you're a very, very uh, elimination of gender-based violence, elimination of violence per se, is crucial to the existence and the vibrancy of any civilization. And when women come up front, they take their equal participation in full force in heart, body, mind, and spirit, and in the way women want to do it with their vision of what they want to do, how they want to lead with love and inclusion, with all of that put in, only then can violence be erased from the hearts of people. Unless we have peace in our hearts, we won't have peace in our societies. So it's a long haul process, but it is impossible to achieve without the activation of women. And of course, with the activation of women, it necessitates the inclusion of families and the participation of everyone on the gender spectrum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Veena Rora, for those words and you know for joining us today. It's, it's a great inspiration. So I welcome everybody, uh, our esteemed speakers, Anju Pandey and Shikha Mukherjee all the members of the ash council and we also have the state councils joining us today and all the participants so the topic or the address today is as uh, you know a support to show support to the 16 days of activism against gender based violence which uh, you know phenomena happening at the same time across the world and today we also is today is also the international uh, human rights day so it is i think very important that we start you know looking at a society and respecting 
each one of us, you know, with all our differences, including people from diverse backgrounds and go together. Right. So I would just start uh, with a very basic presentation as to what is, uh, you know, harassment or, or sexual. <clears throat> just. Start. Uh, somebody's uh, mic is on. Could you please go on mute? Thank you. So uh, sexual harassment uh, is, I mean, the whole idea today was to say that sexual harassment is nothing but gender based violence. And uh, why we are talking about it today is because it transcends all barriers, all boundaries. Uh, it's found across nations, religions, caste, creed, uh, you know, the cultures. So, I mean, I've yet to find a society where we say that sexual harassment does not take place. And uh, there is enough uh, data, enough uh, research done to know what is, what is, what kind of a deep impact sexual harassment leaves on the victim. And not just the victim, but on the victim's family, the society at large, and also on the economy of you know the country. And uh, we, uh, the thing is that it has come to be so trivialized because sexual harassment, as I see it from my childhood, we find it in the public spaces, schools, colleges, workplaces, transport. Uh, you know when we are traveling and at workplaces. So. I don't think there is any area where we can see which is free from sexual harassment and uh, it, we have come to take it for granted. And as we were informally talking uh, with uh, Shikha Mukherjee just before it started that we really need to voice it. I think we've even stopped talking about it. You know, we say Eve teasing and uh, you know whether it's online harassment. So to be able to actually start talking about it, to say it's 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 bothering me, to say that it is nothing but a form of gender based violence is very important. And the fact that we just dismiss it is what is adding to it. At least that's the way I see it. What is sexual harassment? It is any unwelcome sexual behavior. So it's not just physical. It's any behavior which a person may find offensive humiliating or even you know scary if it scares a person intimidates that person it can be physical written verbal it can happen in your real life or on the in the virtual world and anyone as i said you know it's it's inclusive it's not limited just to girls and women though today we are focusing on girls and women but yes it can happen to anyone anywhere anytime and it is gender based violence so as I just said that it can be verbal, it could be whistling, making kissing sounds uh, very often. And sadly, even in courts, I have seen, you know, women being called, uh, you know, chammak challo or honey, doll, uh, you know, uh, item, babe, all these words which have become it's so accepted and part of, you know, the lingo nowadays, but uh, they are demeaning, right? They are demeaning and uh, they are condescending. So when somebody makes a sexual joke or a remark or says a lie about you or comments on how, uh, you know, somebody's looking today, I mean, one is just to say you're looking nice, but when the uh, remark comes laced with a sexual connotation, or when we ask people questions about their sexual life, their fantasies and, you know, push it. So those kind of remarks, nonverbal is when we stare and, uh, you know, this is the discussion I've had with my students also, you know, the elevator eyes to keep your gaze on a woman's face, her eyes when you talk rather than allow your eyes to uh, hover all over the body. When we follow a person, blocking a person's path, making suggestive signals, expressions, winking, all of these are the nonverbal expressions. Then, of course, we have the physical. Again, the physical could be just a rub. Sometimes even a handshake with a person leaves you, uh, you know, feeling, I don't know what, just very icky. You just get that feeling. It's hugging, kissing, putting, uh, you know, somebody puts an arm around your waist. Uh, could be very annoying at times because it's just that feeling you pick up or when somebody just goes brush past you 
uh, and that brush is not just a normal by chance brush. And then, of course, what we a lot of women have been complaining uh, with the rise of COVID is online sexual harassment at workplace and in other spaces with cyber bullying, comments, online threats, cyber stalking, sending you know, uh, sexually tainted messages, jokes, hacking or uh, you know, altering people's images. All of that is within the purview of sexual harassment. Now, what are the effects here? Effects are that the victim may feel stressed, depressed, anxious, may lose confidence, self-esteem, tries to avoid people, social places, social engagements, has problems concentrating, uh, obviously, which translates into a uh, loss of productivity and uh, can also lead to physical manifestations like headaches, backaches, sleep disorders. And so the effects don't stay limited to the victim. It falls into her workspace, her productivity, the economy, her family. All of it comes to suffer the consequences of the harassment. And um, Anju, can yeah. I just request you? To, the, the slides seem to be static. Oh, they are, but they're moving for me here. OK, one second. Yeah, OK, now it's fine. Thanks. You see it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. OK, now uh, are they moving? Do they move? I can see slide nine now on the screen. Uh -huh. I can... Yeah, OK, wait, then I think now you see it. I think yeah. I'll have. To... Yeah, OK, so but um, there is enough data to show uh, that mostly sexual harassment goes unreported. And why is that? That is largely because, um, you know, culturally there is a stigma, you know, women are not encouraged to speak again what we were just discussing, you know, this whole culture of women speaking out and somewhere there is a sense of guilt. Um, you're left with a question that did I encourage it? Was it my fault? Did I call for it? Was it my over friendly behavior? Was it something that I was wearing? Then comes the fear of being disbelieved, especially when the younger girls and uh, you know children are talking about it. Of course, then comes the fear of retaliation or further abuse that if I complain, if it's online, if I write about it or if I talk about it in my workplace, what is the retaliation or backlash I may feel? And then again, the culture of families not having an open discussion on um, sexuality and sex. So again, children or growing up teenagers or young women are very uncomfortable being able to talk about, uh, you know, sexual episodes or misdemeanors. There is still not enough comfort around uh, speaking about these topics at home. So there is a hesitation in communicating with the family. Then at instances, there is a threat. You know, there is a fear that if I complain, what would happen to my family? Could they feel, you know, face any kind of uh, threat or retaliation? And then the most important, which uh, is what I really feel is a big goal for me, is a lack of awareness of women, especially in being unaware of what their rights are and what are the laws which are there to protect us. So in India, um, uh, or before I move into India, I am just going through a blog by the World Bank, uh, which was recently published. And that blog basically talks about um, sexual harassment in South Asia. And what they are talking about is how difficult it is to measure sexual harassment in public spaces and workplaces. And some of the data shows that there was a survey in Delhi which, which says that 66% of women and girls experience sexual harassment in public spaces. In Lahore, a public transport study shows that there were 82% women said that they've experienced sexual harassment during buses and 90% uh, on the buses and 82% uh, on bus stops. In Bangladesh, they shows that one third of women show that in their workplace they have experienced some or the other form of sexual harassment. And what does it do? It affects a woman's mobility. It affects the service, the work she is doing, and also kind of affects the economic opportunities which are available to her and the kind of work, paid work she's able to do. So, uh, and another thing which I found very interesting is that it says 50 uh, countries don't have any law 
to address sexual harassment and gender based violence and those which do have these laws the implementation is a big hurdle you know and which i feel is true of india because in india uh, you know we have enough laws the constitution itself uh, protects us and guarantees us a right of a uh, life of uh, dignity right to life a life which is meaningful and that the government and the society is bound to protect us and for that there are enough laws the indian penal code itself covers things like stalking and eve teasing assault outraging a woman's modesty rape and then of course we have special laws like uh, the it act which covers all the cyber offenses just for example when you have impersonate or you violate the privacy or you send a sexually explicit material it is all punishable right there is up to 5 years imprisonment for uh, you know uh, putting uh, stealing a woman's data or publicizing it or issuing threats all of that is very much covered by the information technology act and then we have specific laws like protection of women through the domestic violence act we have the prevention of sexual harassment at workplace act now all these acts provide us with a lot of mechanisms to report we can go to the police we can uh, you know uh, go to uh, the magistrates we can go to the special officers who have been appointed under these acts but with all this crime has been on a rise what people can do is you can you know even talk to a person who's harassing you you can talk at your school and universities to your teachers find out what the rules are maintain records if it is a cyber harassment take evidence talk to your family talk to people who are experts and then of course lodge a formal complaint if you know that you know it is not ending and you are feeling the stress but in spite of all these measures sexual harassment is on a rise and during the covid time sexual harassment at workplace domestic violence it has all shot up now how do we address this and of course activism days like what we are observing right now go a long way but now i would also ask Uh, you know our speakers today who been working on the ground to address some of these issues and i would like to begin with uh, shikha mukherji shikha ji over to you please if now you could share your experience and enlighten us today uh, thank you anju and i and i am deeply appreciative of this uh, opportunity to be able to participate in something as important as this because um at one level our understanding of sexual harassment still remains uh, a little bit un- dodgy but mostly i think because a large number of people uh, don't want to understand it that's one part of what i want to say the second thing that i would say is that you know between um recognizing acknowledging and and being engaged on on issues of sexual harassment which means recognizing it as well as responding to complaints or even inquiries as you said um there are two ways in which this is playing out one in the urban areas in educational institutions um in workplaces to a limited extent but in other places where really india's women are out and about in the in the so called unorganized sector where most people are employed in in agriculture in places like plantations where there are large numbers of women living on the on the plantations as well as working on the plantations the the recognition of this as a violation as a crime as something which they can demand to be redressed is very very low they don't even recognize that this is happening and that this is something that they should, that that is not normal it is not something that every woman has always experienced in every generation um 
so this is what I want to talk about. And, and the way in which I will do it is by looking at, I, I, in fact, after speaking to you, Andrew, I thought back to the time in 2012-13 when I asked APJ to, um, APJ T in particular, to uh, allow me to write a policy on sexual harassment. And as I said, I had also written a policy on child protection at the same time. So when I started writing the policy on sexual harassment, two things were there. One, that APJT, there were no other tea companies in India, which at that time had a policy on sexual harassment. So we were, we were kind of the first off the ground. The second thing was that the tea industry which has a very old and honored body, which is called the Indian Tea Association, had also not taken it on board. And that is, I think, the, one of the problems that had happened, which is that in, you know, the, from somewhere, the leadership and the push and the push has to come, and it has to come from the top. It cannot, obviously, a policy cannot be written from the bottom nor can the demand come up from the bottom. So somewhere along the line, I think when you're talking about hitting the streets and, and asking for, for an, uh, a recognition of the problem, um, and I think Wiki in that sense does have a significant role to play because when I started writing the policy, it was a blank slate. So, there I am writing this policy. Um, no one, no one in the company, no one in the tea industry is in the least bothered. We write the policy, and then comes the resistance. Because when I'm writing the policy, I'm doing this in Calcutta at the company headquarters. When I'm taking it down to the ground in the tea gardens, then comes the resistance. And so how does the, this resistance come? It comes first from the managers to whom I begin speaking about this policy. And this is, should it be sexual harassment policy or should it be anti-sexual harassment policy? I mean, as though the semantics of it made a big difference to the reality of sexual harassment. <laughs> so, you know, it starts with that. Then there is the great discomfort over talking about what constitutes sexual harassment. And then comes the third thing, which is a denial. It doesn't happen here. And from there, you know, uh, not, not knowing the tea plantations well, or the culture of the tea plantations at that stage uh, well enough, I said, OK, so here is the policy. I've trained you at the official level. You guys now go down and um, train the workforce and concentrate on this. Let us set up the sexual the uh, internal complaints committees. Let us set up a larger committee. Let's do it this way and whatever it was. So I, for a year, I left it to the management to take this policy ahead. And then I found that nothing had happened. I held that one meeting, and that's where it stopped. So I took it down to the next level, where I said, OK, let's get all those who interact most with women, let, let's get them on board, and let's have a meeting. Very uncomfortable meeting. Then realizing that nobody was going to talk about this to the women who needed it most. Um, we deci I decided that I would take it down to where the women were working, exactly in their workplace. So in the field, standing in the field, we start I started these trainings. And then comes uh, this, this amazing conversations that I had, where uh, the manager who was present, and therefore the big boss of this, 800 hectare plantation. Uh, he's standing there and keeping silent. There are there is the staff which supervises these women, all of the men, 
and all of them potential harassers, um, if not potential, then real ha and actual harassers. And they are standing there and saying, but madam, if you tell us that we can't be verbally abusive, if you tell us that we can't shout at them, that we can't be, uh, we, we're not physically violent, but you know, we have to tell them to get a move along and chivy them and push them. If you say that this is all harassment, then how are we going to manage these women? So, and then there is this resistance that it begins to become articulate. Thankfully, it does, because without that articulation, we'll never get the conversation moving. But at the same time, what is happening is that these are people who, through their resistance, and in, I think that is, that, is a, that is a problem that we will have, that the tea industry will have to deal with as they go forward, is that the resistance comes from the top. This is such a hierarchical industry. And I assume that all, all um, sort of um, unorganized industrial units are also very hierarchical. Because you know there is this whole business of who comes on the job, who gets a little bit more preference, etc. That the resistance when it is articulated is also a signal to potential complainants that they should not complain. It's, it's, an, it's a form of intimidation, but we are not being able to recognize it as such. So that is one thing, but, this, but the most interesting part of it, and I think I, I was discussing this with Anju, is that we started the sexual harassment policy at the, exactly at the same time as we start, set up our child protection committees. And the child protection committees were also committees where there were women, there were men, there were, uh, there were, there were staff with that, uh, is in, uh, that is in real control of where the labor force lives. So we had these meetings and from there, the buy-in of the communities was so much greater. It was, in fact, uh, almost exhilarating because there were women who were taking the risk of coming in and complaining about child trafficking, about violence, about abuse, about children not being fed or locked up in homes by their mothers, um, of children um, going into hospitals uh, with injuries, which they said that they had uh, acquired because they fell, but were, but were, which were in fact act, uh, uh, outcomes of violence. So, you know, you have, uh, something happening on child protection, which is a total buy-in of the community. There we have uh, APJ has uh, seventeen gardens. So you know, yes, not in every garden, but in a significant number for it to make a difference and and to be exhilarating. But in terms of sexual harassment, zilch. On the other hand, what one found is that there were a lot of questions uh, a year or so later about sexual harassment outside the plantations. What happens there when we go to the town? What happens when it happens on the road? What happens to our children when they are traveling? But the denial is within the plantation space. And I am, I'm sure that the tea industry is going to deal with it as it uh, grows more comfortable with talking on the subject. But I think one of the problems really is that how does, how do people in authority send down a message that reporting problems is a good thing? It's not a bad thing because every organ in, in, in the culture of 
corporates and organizations. Complaints are treated as a, as a sort of problem thing. It reflects badly on the management or the bosses. And I will leave it here because I think that is some that is an experience that I have, uh, not only in the plantation sector where I could do something about it, but also say within the media. Where, as we all know from the various cases that have happened and the complaints that have happened, the two things that need to be noted is one, the events happened a long time ago and people reported it so much later, about 20 years later in some cases, number one. Number two is that it took me too to galvanize these women into action. So there was something which was so intimidating within the culture of these organizations that they couldn't handle it. And personally, I will tell you that um, I've had 20 years ago, I had a large number of women come to me and say, look, our bosses are harassing us. They use, they're, they're telling these dirty stories. They are making all kinds of innuendos and insinuations and comments, which are very uncomfortable, if not offensive. Uh, please convey this to the management. I said, no, I am not going to because it's not, you have to, you have to come forward with me to do this because I go and complain to the management and then you back out. What do I do? As it is, it was bad enough that I was the first woman editor in Calcutta. So that there was enough bad blood because of that. I said, I don't want to compound things anymore. And then all these women turned around and said, no, but then why don't we quit the newspaper where we are and we'll come and join you? I said, you know, I can't allow that either. If you want to do it, you do it. I'll be very happy to welcome you. But I can't take the initiative. So somewhere there is a, there is, there are problems. We need to internally to us as women, even as a group, which we need to work on. And also within the way in which hierarchies tend to impact something like this, which would, which would affect the perception of how management, managing things is happening at the ground level. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to end there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Shekhadi. Um, really, that is, that is the problem, that we have all the laws, but the ground realities are so different. And... Uh, the pressure that comes from the management and even now when we do the posh trainings and posh workshops, it's what DHR tells us that yeah. uh, if there's a complaint sooner or later, the woman and the man both are asked to leave. Mm -hmm. So that is a reality. So uh, Anju Pandey, uh, over to you to talk to us about your experiences within India and internationally and what is the way out? And is there yeah, well, um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shikadi and Anju, both of you. And of course, uh, uh, you know, before you, uh, Harbin, thanks a lot. I think a lot has been said. And in fact, you know, when you were all speaking, I was just thinking, what more do I add to this? And, and uh, particularly, you know, with uh, Shikadi, leaving it at a note where you think and you kind of go back and start you know, really looking at these things in your head, because, you know, when when Anju, you brought the issue that uh, the HR says uh, sooner or later a case will come and and I was just thinking that, you know, well, not just that, but you will see the senior most management also asking people who are working on these issues Ki aap, and is it OK if I do a mix of Hindi and English? Because, that, you know, then it's like they'll say, up to the both senior managers and so you know messaging go to the tone down you know don't sort of come across as this very 
aggressive feminist, you know, who's here to make their lives miserable, you know, and, and we know that, you know, we know this. So just a couple of quick more, you know, because this I, I'm really looking at this as a more reflective space where, you know, I'm, I'm drawing strength from what had been said, the sisterhood. And I'm sure that, you know, I really do hope that, you know, we have a lot of, we hope, I hope that there are some men and boys and also other gender identities listening into us. But, um, you know, I was, I'm, I'm just borrowing from, I, I'm getting strength from what she said of the sisterhood and really in a reflective space. And I thought I'll add a couple of other dimensions in terms of how do we strategize moving ahead, you know? And, and I think, uh, you know, Anju really, one big part of it is what is our own understanding of, uh, you know, the elephant that we want to deal with? Because um, I think, you know, it's important to also be very clear about what our expectations are. And those are really anchored in what is our understanding, you know, and both of you have very lucidly, uh, you know, shared with us different aspects of it. But, you know, when, for example, I'm going or when you and a woman is going uh, to a manager and, and you know, we, we could have the next whatever, five, six hours only talking about the tea industry because, you know, we just very recently sort of concluded the initial phase of the program working on agrarian supply chains and we identified the tea industry because that's one that, you know, where you have close to, you know, 70% of the, the workforce is women and it is a women intensive industry and and again to address the stereotype that doesn't mean that if there are many women means it's a it's a, a space that is safe from sexual harassment you know i think that's very obvious to a lot of us but i think you know like i said that first of all it's really important to understand uh, this whole gender-based violence and as both of you have said and i'm only reiterating it to understand that women experience certain kinds of violence you know, so even and, and particularly sexual violence is because of who you are. So I'm not saying that now we are hearing, uh, you know, young boys and, and a lot of that's coming up about them experiencing sexual abuse. But, you know, the range and the kind of sexual violence that women experience because of who they are, because of their gender is a lot more, uh, you know, disproportionately uh, you know, the burden is on women and girls. And those forms are normalized on an everyday basis, you know. So when, um, you know, the, the exactly the, the examples that you shared or Shikhadi shared or a range of them that we can talk about is, I think, important to look at two things. One, responding to it. And I think so far we've been really discussing how do you respond? So if I experience sexual harassment, I go to Shikadi or I go to the internal committee of APJ or what do I do? You know, so how do you really strengthen the response side of dealing with this particular form of uh, gender based violence? You know, because that's important. That's mandated by the law. And, and uh, you know, there's a whole history of evolution of that in this country. But I think equally important is the prevention part, you know, and and that's what we've seen in terms of everyday sexism. You know, some examples you were giving everyday sexism that is very normalized and is not questioned. So I'm actually drawing from what Justice Varma has said in his very seminal report, you know, after the Nirbhaya incident. And, and it says that when you ignore lesser crimes, they lead to graver ones, you know, and I think just sort of this tolerance, this culture of tolerance of everyday sexism that's deeply entrenched in a power inequality, you know, so I think it's important for us to understand in addition to gender based violence, what are our workplaces like? And I think, you know, therefore increasingly in our own learning, even with sister agencies like ILO, we are we are, we are, you know, kind of transitioning to a language of the world of work, 
you know, because typically, so if you look at the data, we're looking at only about 8%, if I'm not wrong, Shikhati, which is the organized sector in this country. And then you're looking at a large 92%, that is the unorganized sector. You know, we're not even at the tip of the iceberg. Um, but also to, like I said, that, uh, you know, to really rethink, reimagine, re understand our workplaces. And particularly, the COVID 19 has really thrown that challenge at us. You know, you refer to it, um, Anju, I saw in your presentation where you're saying that, uh, you know, currently we're all work from home as per the definition of the law also right now we are all in a work relationship you know and we've all seen how exponentially women's experiences in these cyber spaces have also gone up you know so i think to sort of better understand what is that workplace like it still continues to be very masculine it still continues to be um, you know, this inequality of power. And, and therefore, I also do want to draw our attention to the law because you talked about it, Anju, that, uh, you know, uh, because when you're looking at different forms of violence, there are different aspects or nuances that we're trying to bring in. In this particular case, the law does not talk about consent at the workplace at all. It only talks about the unwelcomeness of the act. Because I think, you know, that's a good part in the law because it recognizes this inequality of power that is based on gender and therefore consent is immaterial. You know, I mean, if it's my boss or even because of the gender issues, uh, you know, my colleague or somebody who's reporting into me, we know how that transpires and the that, you know, gender inequality, therefore, just like you know, you hear and 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 I'll go to what Chikaji was talking about children. And sometimes you know, I say that I love children, but I hate organizations that work for them. You know, just just bringing in a bit of humor because it's so easy to get people to convert when we're looking at working on children's issues. Very difficult to get their ownership or even the initial buy-in to work on something that has to do with women, just because also that at the end of the day, uh, these are really person, these are personal experiences on both sides, you know? So the third point that I want to bring into our conversation in terms of also finding solutions is that personal is political on both sides, whether it is on the side of the perpetrator or it is on the side of the survivor slash victim. And I'm using both words, you know, so it's it's important for us to understand that politics of the inequality. You know, we can't be naive about it. We can't just be naive and say, here we come to you, uh, you know, the chief manager and sir, here is the law and this is what we're doing. And we expect that, uh, you know, it will be a wonderful thing the next day. I wish it was like that. But because, uh, you know, that politics includes patriarchy, you know, I was desperately Chikaji. Uh, Shikadi trying to bring that word in for sure because it impacts all of us. It's just that it impacts men and boys differently and it impacts all of us differently and other genders differently. But you know that that the privileges that come with it, who wants to give up on it? You know, who wants to? It's not easy. They will not give up on it, you know, unless we are thinking through of a strategy where, um, you know, which is long term, you know, you can have some short term gains, Anju, but if you're thinking, ki, uh, you know, sometimes we also smile and reflect and laugh and we say that, you know, all these amazing slogans that we have that are planet 50 50 by 2030. I said, well, I will be the most happy old woman in 2030 if that is the transition we are able to bring by 2030. But I think it's aspirational and therefore we also have to keep those goalposts uh, clear for us and have those goalposts for us. Otherwise, you know, there will always be a despondency that will creep into our thinking, into our planning, into our conversations, you know. So 
I, I mean, I, I think, you know, therefore, if I'm looking at the transition that is happening, you know, uh, the change that we are seeing, and, and I'm, I don't want to, you know, defend the men and boys here, but I do want to share a data point because, you know, when I'm talking about patriarchy, we know this so well that it does, uh, you know, it's very tempting and, and uh, you know, to say, yeah, come on. I mean, ye to itna obvious hai, ye to samaj mein aana chahiye. and most often you will find that men may do use this as an excuse. Ki, hame pata hi nahi aap kya baat kare. You know, we are this very wonderful human beings here. But, but you know, a study Shikadi that we had done in uh, just before Nirbhaya happened and it continued after that in Delhi. It was a baseline study for a program whose methodology we have used for the tea industry that looked at safe cities and safe public spaces. 95% of the girls in that study said that, and we had a close to a sample of about 5,000 uh, in four wards of Delhi, and 95% of the women and girls said they had experienced some form of sexual harassment in public spaces. And, um, you know, and as high as 75% of the men and boys we spoke to said they had seen a woman experiencing it, but 56% of the men and boys said we didn't know what to do, you know. So this whole conversation about the bystander, uh, you know, and uh, are also stereotypes that only men are going to be the bystanders. What about, you know, that's why I'm drawing and I'm so happy that uh, Harbin talked about the sisterhood because, you know, you're then looking at a multiplicity of issues even at the workplace, you know, why don't women speak? And I think increasingly we are seeing that change. Both of you have looked at, um, you know, the reasons for that. But I think if you're looking in terms of solutions, it's very important to have anything that has to do with your organization to, like I say, get the voice choice agency and safety of women in that. So, you know, one of our learnings from multiple, uh, you know, sectors, both agrarian and non-agrarian, has been that the, the policies get drafted at this level, has no engagement with uh, the women or women agents of change who are going to be impacted by it. So I think, you know, bringing their experiences into it is critical. The second that gender based violence is a factor of gender inequality. It's both a cause and a consequence of it. So if we are talking about that, that means that, you know, you have to look at what are the other interlinks with women's economic autonomy, with women's rights, economic rights, you know, in the governance system. So you we really have to have a whole of sector approach. So even though we might be really focusing you know, for example, on um, on gender based violence or on sexual harassment, it's important to look at what are your other enabling policies. And that's what we did. You know, when we worked on sexual harassment, we also looked at the hiding policy. We also looked at the health policy. We also looked at, um, you know, the other related enabling policies, including dedicated budgets, because, you know, many times uh, the governments and and private sector and the you know other spaces, including the civil society, we have great intentions, but we don't dedicate budgets. So you know we will have the policy, but you will keep no money to do the trainings on sexual harassment. So how are they going to happen? So I think you know really having this whole of sector approach um, uh, will for sure help us in finding uh, solutions because then you're not looking at women only, quote unquote, as these victims, but also very active agents of change in their own lives. You know, I do want to, you know, uh, sort of bring in a couple of other issues that it's important for us to keep in mind that women are not a homogenous, uh, uh, you know, sort of group and that some women, because of their historical marginalized status or because they come from certain resource poor settings, because of their caste, class, age, ethnicity, sexual identity, abilities, uh, will be, uh, you know, will be more vulnerable, will experience this more. So although we may have 
sort of a common, um, you know, sort of uniform policies. I think it's critical for us to bring in their voices, but also to identify the unique vulnerabilities that they may have because of these intersections. And it could be Shikadi. I mean, that that's something we've been talking to the tea industry. If you're really looking at the history of the tea industry and all that comes with the women in the tea industry and, you know, all of these these complexities, but nuances also that I'm talking about. I mean, I know that we have very defined time, but um, I, I also do do want to sort of alert us that, uh, you know, the one of things will not work. And like you rightly said, Shikhadi, the buy-in from the highest is very critical. You know, if it's not there, impossible, impossible to move, you know. So, but our strategy has to be multifaceted. While you're going to them, you also have to start investing in those women. And one of the things that you and women does um, and, and, you know, that's a constant methodology discussion that we have with UNICEF, our sister agency. You know, in terms of working on the ground, it's very easy to, uh, and I'm, I'm just picking up practical examples, you know, it's very easy to uh, appoint a project coordinator and say that you go and work on child rights issues. Nobody is going to object in the community. You know, like you rightly said, everybody will rally together. You appoint a single woman to go and start working in a community on uh, issues of women's rights. She will be, you know, from every side, she will be targeted. So in terms of our strategy, you know, as you and women, we firmly believe that you have to invest in the collectivization of women. You have to invest in bringing them together, you know, so it's very heartening to be in a forum like wikis because that's precisely what you're all doing and as an example that's what we try to do in as a model in the tea industry and the tea estates that we worked with is to get these women and and you know i mean they're all uh, like like i talked about the agency so i also get worried about this you know be very benevolent approach that we go with that now we are going to come and make a difference in your lives no these are very smart women in their own rights, and they understand the issues. We need to work together. We have to stop doing the othering. You know, it's not something that happens to some women out there. This is a reality, like I said, on both sides, uh, you know, from the phrase that personal is, is political. So investing in, in sort of mechanisms or structures that can be sustained you know, including capacity building, including hand holding, all of that, you know, is really very critical. And these have to be spaces that are safe for women, you know, so in offices like, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not anymore, but when I used to go for the sexual harassment internal committee meetings of some of the organizations that I was on, we wouldn't even find us, you know, an exclusive place to sit to talk to, uh, uh, you know, to the complainant. And again, you know, we're talking about confidentiality, etc. But we have to then find of innovative ways of making sure that, uh, you know, not everybody's looking at her saying, oh, you went, uh, you know, or there's something that is going on with you. So the principles have to be translated and simplified and made into actionable points uh, talking to the women and girls they have the solutions you know so uh, even though we may come with the experience i think localizing and finding those solutions local solutions is critical i just only want to highlight three more two more points um, one data and uh, evidence research, whether it is perception surveys or even getting data, you know, the data is so dismal. Again, there are multiple reasons for it, because like Shikadi said, women may not want to come and talk about it. But I think we should respect that. You know, I know that there's, there's this whole urgency and the Me Too movement also saw that, that we're pushing women to go and file a complaint. And then there was the flip side of it that if you're not filing a complaint, that means it's a false complaint, you know. So I think we really have to challenge some of these uh, patriarchal interpretations of women's 
feminist positions and we should respect her if right now she's not ready to do that, but at the same time provide her the support that she needs. So, you know, data uh, in, in terms of a range of issues, whether it is on compliance side or it's on experience side or it's on perception side, I think we really need to invest in more data generation and more research. I know that many times I myself question and I say we don't need more research. We know what the issues are, but unfortunately for the policymaker, sometimes even the most obvious doesn't cut ties unless they don't see the numbers there. And last but not the least, you know, is this whole bit of the social norm and behavior change. You know, many times people say ki ham measure kaise karenge, ho ka kya, pata kaise chalega ki is training ke baad aaj shikha anju aur anju aur harbeen hamari soch mein kuch badlaav aaya hai. I think there are enough tools that are available now to really look at, you know, robustly investing in these behavioral and social norm changes. You know, I'm so happy to share with you that as we're speaking, just yesterday I read that the World Bank has rolled out its first um, GBV integrated into its procurement policy. You know, something that UN Women has been reflecting in that space. So really bringing in the accountability of the vendors on GBV because, you know, Anju, you come with a law background. We know the law clearly says that there is an accountability that you have even for the visitor, you know, even if that visitor is your vendor. So really finding what are what do we have to hold ourselves accountable to in terms of compliance and then finding how do we translate this and and uh, you know the, we could have a whole session on social norm and behavior change you know i mean we can go on and on about that but i do want to end on the last point that i often find that uh, you know, they'll say, but budgets nahi hai. Paisa kahan se aega? Agar aap sexual harassment ke, and I'm not even going to name Shikadi, but we've heard it so often, you know, ki, you know, where is the money going to come? Who's going to, you know, this is going to cost a lot to make uh, the, the, the women safer. But I think, you know, while on the 10th of December, which is the Human Rights Day, we talk about the the human rights argument, the first and foremost, as a citizen of this country, as a human being, I have a right to a safe, you know, private, public work and cyberspace. I think it's important that we also start learning to use the economic argument. We resist it a lot, but I think it does work with people, particularly it does work with men, because probably that's the language that they understand and really, uh, you know, take the bull by the horn, because many times I also find that as soon as you're talking about gender initiatives and particularly GBV, uh, they will be ready to do stuff which is low cost. And like, you know, I'm borrowing from what our executive director says that gender equality doesn't come cheap. Don't sell yourself cheap, you know. It, there is enough that may exist in most places they may not be, but I think the whole idea is to partner, to collaborate and back your intentions with policies, back your intentions with budgets, because if you don't do the budgets, we can go on from one to the next to the next. People will all express wonderful intentions. I'm just sharing the report is not out as yet, but we work very closely with governments and we've just done, I'm not even going to name the state because we don't want to stigmatize states. This is a global issue, like I said, it's a national and a local issue, but we've just done an analysis of, uh, you know, the state budgets to look at what is the percentage um, which is very focused on gender-based violence. And it's not, it's even, not even, you know, like, a 1.2 percent of the state budget. Whereas there's so much of conversation that is currently going on about gender-based violence, about one-stop centers, about helplines. So I think, you know, I would stop at that note and do a lot more thoughts that are in my mind. Uh, but, you know, just the, the few that I thought were urgent that um, if we want to really emerging from the COVID and the COVID could be a whole discussion in itself. And if we want to build back 
better. It has to be built back better. That is just and equal. And I think COVID is giving us a lot of opportunities, including on the issue that we are discussing uh, to see how the world tomorrow will be different. And I think there are some excellent examples, including the voices that are represented in the panel, including the amazing work that Chikadi has been doing. So from the micro to the ma macro, there are excellent emerging good practices that can be replicated that we can learn from. So I'll end on that positive note. Thank you so much, Anju. Thank you so much. And uh, just yesterday at another webinar when we were talking and uh, you know, panelists there was also mentioning as to the funds part, you know, where the government's intention, exactly what you're saying, we can, yeah. they can keep saying we have the intention, but even what was to be released after the Nirbhaya case, what was promised, and how they, even if they have promised and it is being released, but there is no transparency. Completely. And how it is going into, you know, saying, humne camera laga diye, you know, which is supposed to be probably out of the police budget. So how is that fund, which is so, yeah. fun, you know, addressing violence against women? Where is that fund? Even if you have increased it, yeah. it is actually, as you're saying, just, you know, one or two percent. I mean, sounds big in numbers, but when you translate yeah. it into the percentile and how, where is the transparency? Who knows and how is it being used? And the, and the monitoring, Anju, of that, yeah. that expenditure, the implementation. So just to quickly add that, you know, we are on the last day of the 16 days of activism, which are very focused starting on the 25th of November, which is the international day to eliminate all forms of violence against all women. But this year, you know, and until, of course, uh, we come to the next, there are four words that the UN system um, is using, uh, you know, as a campaign, um, you know, to take action. And the first is fund. The second is respond. The third is prevent. And the fourth is collect. And the funding does say give dedicated funds for uh, women uh, GBV services. You know, we saw during the lockdown, women were confined to their homes. Um, it, it, another quick interesting data point, you know, just to take us away a little bit from the, the, the sexual harassment at the workplace. The 2011 census data, and we are soon going to have the 2021 census, the 2011 census, 71% of the households in India are only one or two roomed. So you look at the, the population size that we're talking about during the pandemic. And we do know that, you know, given the fact that there was love lockdown, there was job insecurity, there were food crisis, health issues, all of that that, you know, we are aware of. Uh, violence went up, alcoholism went up, the services were not available, and women could go, you know, to their traditional, um, the, the traditional allies uh, when they were experiencing violence. They couldn't call, reach out their families, they couldn't go to the neighbors, they couldn't call, um, you know, their, their friends. Um, we know very well many uh, families where only one cell phone, the woman is not able to call, she does not even have that safe space. So we're saying, please make GBV services as essential services, you know, and at that time when I'm going to a police officer, that police officer is completely at that moment burdened by food distribution. So he's telling me, Koi baat nahi, isme si badi baat hai. Abhi ghar jaye, baad So, you know, I think investing in services and making them essential services is critical. That's one of the demands that all of us, you know, women's groups that we work with have been making that whether it is a one-stop center, whether it is a helpline, whatever currently exists, please make it an essential service, you know, because women... Uh, women have died, we know, during COVID. We know so many cases, but I do want us to look at, you know, like I said, majority of the health functionaries in India are women, and they were all going to work. We looked at the migrant crisis in Delhi, 20,000, very close to where I live. No news. The women are completely invisibilized in that, you know, one monolith of the migrants. We have no face of a woman migrant. And I saw women 
pass by my house at 9, 10, 11 in the night with babies on both sides carrying luggage and there were so many women and girls. I dread to even think what happened to them in terms of sexual abuse. Total silence, no data, no experiences, no conversation. So we're saying make these services essential, have flexible funds. You have to keep women's gender needs in mind. They're different from men. So have flexible funding available. Then, of course, like I said, second, responding to women, you know, and again, we'll have to think of innovative ways. Like I said, women couldn't read. So there are many interesting things even we are doing. We've just released a, a phone based application called My Umber with NASCOM Foundation. It's an informational app for women survivors and their allies. Just deals with a lot of issues. And the interesting thing is it also has a masking feature. So if I'm a survivor and I'm looking at it and my perpetrator walks, I can just press the button and it immediately becomes a weather app. You know, so just innovation using technology is critical. We're also developing a chat bot to see that, you know, uh, uh, but again, solutions that also have to be for the non-literate and the ones who are new literate. So a lot needs to be done in terms of responding. Prevention ka to antihin conversation ho sakta hai, Anju. You know, on norms, behaviors, in our homes, when the boys come back and we say, abhi, te, abhi to ladkon ke khelne khalne ki umre hai. You know, every day I can pick many to, you know, our workplaces to schools to wherever on, on, on prevention, but last on collecting data, uh, hearing uh, feminist stories, hearing feminist voices, hearing everyday experiences, uh, you know, so that the ones who are talking about it are not singled out and trolled. Now in cyberspace, we see that a lot. The moment you open your mouth, you see how you will be trolled. So, you know, those are the four, um, you know, areas that we're keeping for ourselves. And of course, working in collaboration with a multiplicity of partners, including the kind of forum where we're meeting each other today. Thank you so much. And, you know, sadly, I have to look at the clock. So now yeah. uh, quickly, what are the questions? If any of the participants has a question. Hello. Yeah, Rakshika, yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yeah, yes, a very good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Anju Ma'am and Shikha Ma'am, for such an illuminating talk. It's been so lovely listening to you, and I've learned so much in the span of an hour. And I personally resonate deeply with whatever it is that is anti-sexual harassment or sexual harassment, as if, like Shikha Ma'am said, the semantics of which are not really relevant here. But this is something that I deeply, deeply uh, feel involved with because I feel like as a lot of like most of us here have experienced some sort of sexual harassment and it affects the everyday fabrics of our lives. It takes away our agency, our autonomy, our freedom to as much as even walk outside in the dark. And it makes us feel that it helps us. It makes us feel like we have this defeated mindset, like we can't live our lives to the fullest. And this is something that I've seen a lot uh, with women and people who do not identify uh, as men. Uh, my question here is uh, in terms of uh, how, what we can do uh, when we look at the marginalized groups, like when we talk about women in the unorganized sector, we are also talking about uh, women who are poor and uh, women who, ha who have difficult backgrounds and who have uh, been not really welcome in the community due to their caste. So um, we're looking at uh, people who also do not identify as men. And these are, the, these are the groups that are more vulnerable to harassment and sexual harassment, to be more specific. So we also need to develop a more intersectional lens at looking at things. So uh, this is something that I would really like to learn more about. And how do we do it as a collective? Because whatever it is that is happening right now is based on othering. Like women also sort of end up being engaged in othering and do not believe other women who even end up coming out or you know speaking out and it just ends up becoming a whole futile process so i just would really like if uh, any of you could please throw some light upon it thank you 
Shikati, you want to go first? Please go ahead. Uh, your mic is mute. Uh, Anju, I think you kind of um, kick off and then I'll add. <laughs> okay, so I hope uh, I uh, Rashika is that. Uh, did I get your na name right? It's Rakshika. Rakshika. Okay, yeah. Thank yes. you, thank you, Rakshika, and uh, thank you so much for you know raising that very pertinent issue. So, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, and also something that we've been doing forever, but we're also emphasizing this year, is to believe the survivors. You know, believe them. And so, one part is where we say, okay, what are the principles that inform our thinking or our planning? And then the other part is like the question that you're asking that how do we go about it? How does, for example, what should Vicky do? You know, so Vicky for sure could look at, um, you know, and I'm sure you already have it in terms of what are your guiding principles that inform your planning, your thinking, um, and, and then you can think through on actions around it. I would think, you know, and I'm borrowing from one of the lines of the black feminists who say that nothing for us without us. So I think, you know, it's important when we're talking about these intersections that those interests, those voices, those representations have to be from them and with them, you know. And when I'm saying that, I'm not using the word them in this kind of, a, you know, exclusionary manner. But I'm really saying, and that's why I use that phrase, that nothing for us without us. So just like Vicky has is doing this now on sexual harassment, I'm sure Vicky could do another webinar which is focused on intersectionality, which is focused on listening to the voices of the marginalized community, which is looking listening to what is happening with the with, for example, the Dalit women at the workplace, you know, and there are many amazing people out there who will be able to also then give recommendations on what will work. I think it will also be like where you're looking at very dedicated actions, whether it is in your policy. Uh, you know, I talked about normalization, Rashika, because I find that, you know, our thinking is so normalized and these gender things are so deeply ingrained that many times we just take it for granted and even our policies continue to be gender um, insensitive or gender blind, if that's the word I want to use. So might be a good idea to look at, relook at your policies from an intersectionality perspective. And the easiest to do will be, I find, to look at from the perspective of the women with disabilities. You know, what is Vicky doing? How are, I'm, I'm just speaking, I'm thinking really, like I said, it's a reflective space. How is your office organized? Is it a, you know, persons with disability friendly office? What is the kind of infrastructure that you have? If I were a person with disability visiting Wiki today, uh, what would I experience? I'm giving very chotu examples that have a bearing on the life of women and girls from there to the highest in terms of really the articulation of policy, the drafting of our programs, the investments in those programs, the designing of them. So, you know, there's a range of actions that can be taken on intersectionality. Chikati? Yeah, Anju, um, you know, I would go, go to a, a, a point that Rakshika, actually, the way in which Rakshika framed it, which is that um, the unorganized sector. Now, this is a sector where yep. um, women are a part of the workforce. Uh, as you point out, there is a lot of invisibility. Uh, women in the unorganized sector have very little protection. Um, and 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 I think one of the problems is that no one, while drafting the laws or even thinking about them, thought about the unorganized sector as a workspace. Uh, where, how do you set up an ICC? Yeah. How do you reach out to them? 
the places where they live, the conditions under which they work, their vulnerabilities, both in terms of caste as well as uh, their own economic needs. Uh, how on earth do we connect to them is the question yeah. that is very, is very high on my list of confusions about yeah. how to take this forward. The second thing that I will um, suggest to Wiki is to have a look at how the pandemic is affecting women's employment. Already in yeah. their participation, the women's participation, participation. labor work, force participation, yeah. labor force participation in India is horrible. Mm -hmm. it, is, yep. it, is, it is it is shamefully low and it is so low that you know it is it, 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 it is hurting our economy it is hurting production it is hurting gdp it's doing a lot of things but now that there is this crisis and there is this re reordering of the workspace the reordering of city spaces the reordering of public places what is going to happen to women's participation in in labor yep this totally. is a question that I mean, if it's violence that we are talking about, if it is exclusion, which is a form of violence, then I, I am very, very afraid that more women are going to be out of work and facing the consequences of something that, like that happening. And I find that um, there is absolutely a, I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't not, I can fault myself for not writing enough about it. Um, but really that's not my specialization. There are people who should be doing it. And and they're doing it, you know. I I, I mean, there's but some very enough, interesting. I not Sorry. enough, I agree with you. I agree, Shikhan. You know, it's not, I mean, it's we've also not just- targeted. It yeah, is not yeah. targeted. It is yeah. about, uh, uh, you know, sec what is happening to labor force participation per se? What is happening to ours? I mean, look at the fact that no one has seriously taken a view, and I mean seriously in the sense of the economists, the yeah. statisticians, the, the sociologists, have they addressed the issue of what happens to women's participation when working hours are extended to 12? Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's just a really important issue you're raising, Shikhadi. And because, I think, you know. Because how is a woman going to do all that she does okay. and then yeah. work 12 hours? So what we are doing, what the policies of this yeah. government have done is created situations where women's participation is going to be pushed down as a result of policy. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing that I hope Wiki uh, takes on because it is very, very important. Yes. And um, completely hear you on that. Yeah, just a review yeah. of some of the packages as well. And, and just to quickly share that, you know, we are kind of now finalizing a rapid assessment that we did of the social economic impact of COVID on women, you know, so just wanted to just share it's not it's not final as yet. And then, you know, there a lot of what you're saying is literally what we knew. But like I said that, you know, now there is enough evidence that we are hearing on that, including, for example, we found that there was an increase in in early marriage, early marriage yeah. for girls. Yeah. Yes, because of the simple reason, Shikadi, because of the simple reason that once the lockdown was staggered opening started, then because they said, Ki yaar, logon ko aap bula sakte hai shadi mein. So they said, oh, this is the best time to get your daughter married off because aapko logon ka kharch karna padega, you know, so it's not like you have to spend a lot on her. So early marriage is also on the rise because of the fact that families don't have to bear, quote unquote, the burden of expenses of getting the daughter married off, you know, to a range that we are discussing. What I've also heard is that these early marriages are happening because 
as the income or disposable mm -hmm. income within yeah. families it's, it's, has shrunk yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so and, and the shrinkage has been so yeah real yeah. you know the the fewer people you have yes the less this the less yes. mouths to feed the less mouths to feed so yeah. what the doctors married off send them away and then there is trafficking yep such a dangerous thing and um i think that there is so much that we need to look at at this point in time because the crisis has has actually put into very stark focus yeah. both the institutional policy implementation and cultural yeah and not just that i mean what we were talking about is also the fact that you know with women at home and children at home you see the burden of work at home has increased and then you have work from home so at home and from home how are you balancing that and if a mother is working then sadly the burden is now come to a daughter if there is a daughter at home in the teenage it's coming to her you know ki okay tumhari padhai ho gayi ab tum ye 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 kar do tum bhai ko dekh do tum so that whole dynamic again of the pandemic on how it has affected and if if the parents today cannot afford any more education then it's the girl child who's getting pulled out you know yeah. just so totally. it's affected in not just one way the ramifications are huge mm -hmm. and Yes, huge and endless. And and also just quickly to add the intergenerational transference of violence. You know, with these yes. confined spaces, yes. another big issue. We've big, no big idea big. what's going on in our homes. Yeah. 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 So I think we're left with a lot of more topics to come up with uh, discussions <laughs> like this. I see a lot of people have left, but we are also engrossed, yeah. and I feel bad ending it here. I'm sure there are That's more fine. questions. but i think i'll have to organize another one very soon and shikadi and anju be ready to be a part of it and make it a longer time period thank, thank you so much. much thank you so much for pouring your hearts out and i think it's it's really been a huge learning and i will also connect with both of you individually also to see how we can take all that we talked today forward thank you very much thank you dr harbin for uh, forming wiki and giving us this opportunity thank you everybody thank you pranjal nikita and rakshika for also help me organize this really grateful to all the other wiki members and participants who joined us today thank you very much hopefully we we'll can and stay safe everybody yes thank you thank you shikha bye. thank you everybody bye 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 shikha take care bye. You take care too. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.